Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. If you are new here, please hit that subscribe button as well as the thumbs up button and leave a comment below. If you're listening on a podcast platform such as Spotify, Apple, or Google, or wherever you get your podcast, be sure to hit that five-star rating. All right, folks, first up, I want to let you know about a big interview I have this week. I will be interviewing Kevin Mole, who's the head of global digital assets at Western Union. So we're going to learn how Western Union is going to le leverage crypto uh, for payments and much more. Uh, recently, Western Union conducted a retail CBDC pilot with the Digital Dollar Project. So Chris Giancarlo will also participate in the interview. And Kevin was actually formerly at Ripple, so he knows a lot about payments. This should be a really great interview. Make sure you got that notification bell enabled, folks, and that you are subscribed as well as you're subscribed to the newsletter uh, because this is going to be a really great interview. Obviously, Western Union, one of the largest payment companies in the world. So it's going to be very insightful to hear how they are leveraging crypto and blockchain. All right, let's jump into the news. Mark Cuban loses $870,000 in a hot wallet hack. Mark Cuban confirmed that he was hacked, but doesn't know precisely how. Folks, you know, when I hear news like this, it's uh, look, it does get my alarm bells going because you never know what these hackers are up to. And even the most sophisticated users in crypto, those who may be OGs, have to make sure we do our due diligence and we go through our checklist of security layers to make sure everything's up to par because these hackers, that's their job. They do it all day looking to hack us. Uh, the other day I told you guys about, I got a phone call from a uh, a call center, a scam call center, and the number appeared as Chase Bank, but they said they were from Coinbase and that they were someone was trying to log into my account, but I knew that was fake. And the good thing is uh, they gave me my public email. They're like, oh yeah, someone was using, uh, or we know your email address is you know this and this. And I was like, yeah, whatever. That's my public email. That's not even the, log, the email I used to log into the platform. So you want to make sure you have the different uh, security layers, folks. So independent blockchain sleuth WAZ, uh, W-A-Z-Z, -Z, was the first to spot the hack on September 15th at around 8 p.m. UTC after they highlighted suspicious behavior with one of Mark Cuban's wallets that the 65-year-old hadn't interacted with for roughly five months. So according to the transaction history on Etherscan, several batches of assets such as USDC coin or USDC, Tether, and Lido staked Ether, so STETH, were suddenly withdrawn from the wallet within a 10-minute window. Adding complexity to the matter, another $2 million worth of USDC was then also withdrawn and sent to a different wallet, leading Waz to suspect that Cuban may have just been moving assets around. However, a few hours later, Cuban confirmed to DL News that he had gone on MetaMask for the first time in months and vaguely suggested that the hacker or hackers may have been watching and waiting for a moment to pounce. Cuban added that he had transferred any remaining assets to Coinbase custody, essentially confirming that the $2 million USDC transaction was him. In terms of the hack, members of the community were quick to point out that uh, as opposed to hackers watching Cuban's activity, he must have done something that led to the security breach. Some suggested that Cuban may have mistakenly signed a malicious transaction, while others asserted that his private key was compromised given that the funds were directly transferred out of the wallet. Um, so this really sucks, folks. Um, and this is why you got to protect your private keys. You got to make sure you're using the right version of these apps. And I personally don't use MetaMask because they have a history of having a lot of issues. Now, I'm not saying it's MetaMask's fault here. We don't know all the details, but we'll have to wait and see. But I personally use uh, the Ledger hardware wallet. Um, and, uh, and you know, as far as exchanges that I trust that have insurance uh, that I know are not going to shut down overnight, I use like Coinbase, right? So you want to make sure you use valid platforms and uh, platforms that have uh, insurance and they have great custody and much more. But uh, this really sucks. Now, obviously, Mark is a billionaire, so I'm sure he's now, uh, you know, staying up at night. You and I, if we lost this level of money, I'm sure we would be up, uh, you know, a night uh, worrying about this. But uh, it is what it is. And, and this is why, folks, it doesn't matter who you are, how long you've been in the crypto market. Be sure you have the different security checklists uh, or the security layers in place and that you are maybe doing a monthly check-in that, hey, everything's in the right spot. 
everything that I have up and running is still running and that um, maybe I need to change passwords, whatever it is, that might be something that's helpful as well. So just be sure you do your due diligence. You don't want to lose your money. These hackers, they, this is what they're doing 24 seven, trying to breach uh, and steal people's funds. Now, uh, CZ of Binance, he tweeted about this. He said, Mark, Mark Cuban confirms he got hacked for $870,000 on MetaMask. Um, he said, this happens to the most experienced of crypto users. He said, read this article I wrote three years ago. There's a section about downloading software, wait 74 hours, et cetera. So essentially, if you download any specific wallet, you know, just wait. Don't go transfer funds to it right away. Uh, but anyway, there's there's a whole bunch of tips that he provides. So you guys can check that out. That's what CZ tweeted out. Now, speaking of Binance, folks, there's been a lot of drama, a lot, a lot of drama here. And uh, I'm actually kind of worried about Binance US, not so much Binance.com. I've interviewed CZ two times over the years. Um, if Binance.com was open to US users, I would you know, definitely be using the platform because I used it back in 2017, 2018. And uh, US is going to be, I think, in a lot of problems because obviously you have the lawsuit, you have potential DOJ uh, filing coming after them. Uh, we had the resignation of their exec team. Uh, but CZ put out a statement here. So let me read it to you guys. He said, there has been some speculation regarding recent management changes at Binance US. Brian Schroeder is taking a deserved break uh, after accomplishing what he set out to do when he joined two years ago. Under his leadership, Binance US raised capital, improved its product and service offerings, solidified internal processes, and gain significant market share, all of which helped to build a more resilient company for the benefit of customers. We are grateful for this uh, or for his contributions. The crypto market is in a different place now than it was two years ago, with a rapidly evolving and increasingly hostile regulatory environment. Norman Reed, former SEC, New York Fed, Ripple, and DTCC executive is the right person to lead Binance US this in this market. So he said, ignore FUD, keep building. So they promoted Norman Reed essentially to now lead Binance US. But, you know, I want to trust my gut here, right? And once again, nothing against CZ, nothing against Binance.com. But the situation, as CZ said himself, a very hostile regulatory environment, Binance US is in the crosshairs of the regulators and what I've been hearing out of DC from the people I've been talking to, Binance does not have a good name in DC. So I am not doing anything with Binance US. And it seems like a lot of people are recognizing this because their volume has slumped uh, amid all this situations and you know crises, if you want to call it that. Um, and I, I think people recognize like, okay, yeah, I should probably pull my funds out here, right? It's not, it's not prudent to go trade on this platform and put a ton of capital and money because you are putting yourself at risk. Once the storm passes and if Binance US is still up and running and they've resolved some of these things, then yeah, we can go back to trade on it. But I personally would recommend not getting involved with anything Binance US right now. I don't know uh, what's around the corner. And like I said, guys, from what I've been hearing from people, I, you guys know I talk to uh, advocacy groups members of Congress, regulators, and so forth. There's not uh, a, a lot of love for Binance in DC. So just be wary of this and we'll see where things go. Now, uh, Eleanor Tourette of Fox Business, uh, she tweeted out the following saying, the judge in the SEC versus Binance case has granted the SEC's motion to unseal previously sealed documents, including motion to compel and for other relief and opposition to Binance US's motion for a protective order. So we shall see, folks. There's a lot of heat coming down on Binance. Now, speaking of exchanges, an exchange that I trust and that I've been using since 2018 is Uphold. And yes, they're one of the great platforms. I've interviewed their CEOs and many other folks there. So I can vouch for this platform. They have 10 plus million users, 250 plus cryptocurrencies, and they're available in 150 countries. You can also trade precious metals and 37 national fiat currencies. So you can uh, you know, switch between these different currencies, including precious metals and crypto. So it's a really unique platform. So if you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description.
Now, we got some very interesting news coming out of Japan. Japan to let startups raise VC funding via digital assets. This is according to the Nikkei. The proposed regulation would include digital assets among the existing investment options for VC firms, which are, of course, venture capital firms targeting emerging crypto startups. Very big development here, folks. We see the on and off ramps being built for different industries and different levels of investors. Uh, very, very bullish in my opinion. So according to a report by the Nikkei on Friday, the plan from the Japanese government is expected to be submitted to parliament as early as next year. Blockworks reached out for further confirmation. Traditionally, the VC environment in Japan has been seen as conservative compared to more aggressive markets like Silicon Valley. Regulations have been uh, viewed as stringent and the investment seen risk averse. Limited partnerships, the common vehicle for VC investment in Japan, are generally restricted to more conventional assets. The rule would add digital assets to a list of investment avenues able to those firms looking to put money into building or budding crypto startups, including stock options and securities. The significance of venture capital in Japan's corporate landscape has been growing for several years and is projected to further amplify its presence in both capital markets and public disclosure. According to data provided by PitchBook, the average funding size has jumped more than 390% year over year from $65 million in 2022 to $321 million. So folks, when I see stuff like this, it just makes me more bullish than ever and looking forward to future bull markets and bull runs, right? Right now, we are certainly in that transition phase from bear to bull. We are not in full bear market. We're not in full bull market. We're in that transition, right? Because we bounced off the bottom. You see Bitcoin's chart uh, as well as some altcoins. And we just have to be patient. The Bitcoin halving is next year. Uh, we're expected to see QE come back next year and a start of or increase of global liquidity and much more. And uh, we're going to be back in a bull market. You know, this current environment is temporary as it has been historically. Markets move in cycles, folks. And once you understand that, you know how to plan your strategy, take your profits, buy the blood on the streets, buy the dips and uh, rinse and repeat because it's, if you study the market cycles, the charts, the money supply, the money printing, they it, this is the system we live in, the debt-based system. And it does affect crypto, right? L the global liquidity rise just does move the price of all assets, including crypto. So uh, we will be back in a bull market and we are seeing the groundwork being laid here, the infrastructure being built for crypto, the money to flow into crypto essentially. And obviously that's going to lead to higher prices. Now, we got some news around Justin Sun. So Justin Sun prints $800 million in little-used stablecoin. The billionaire trader raised eyebrows today by minting a massive sum of unstable or unusual stable, I should say. Uh, look, Justin Sun has a very shady background. I don't really trust anything this guy does, man. He's He's got a lot of money, and he's probably one of those guys I wouldn't be surprised if governments go after. Um, he's been doing a lot of shitty stuff over the years, um, but we'll see what happens. So on Friday, HTX board member Justin Sun undertook a mass printing of the little used stablecoin TUSD, a move that caught the attention of traders as over $815 million entered circulation in less than 15 minutes. Starting at 11.45 a.m. ET, uh, data from TronScan shows that $815 million TUSD was minted directly to the Tron blockchain across a series of 10 transactions. Each of the mints was to a new address, which then immediately sent funds to the Huobi 2 hot wallet. So Justin is the founder of Huobi, also Tron. Um, God, I hope that the, these... <laughs> Stable coins are actually backed. Now it is eight hundred fifty million dollars uh, in comparison to the other stable coins. That's not really a big deal, but man, this is why we need regulations, folks. Right? Just to make sure that these things that are uh, being minted, these stable coins, they have the reserves. They have the reserves, no problem. Do you know? God bless. Do your thing. Right? Go ahead and mint, but just make sure you have that those reserves. We don't need. Uh, you know, any type of fake transactions, any type of scams, they're going to crash and put us in a FTX Celsius type situation again. I think we can all agree on that, right? 
We need regulations. Uh, there is certainly a balance there. We don't want the government to stifle stifle innovation. We don't want the government to uh, go crazy and stop and put up roadblocks, but rather, hey, you're minting all this stuff? Show us the reserves, right? And there's audits being done and all that jazz. Uh, we need that for the, uh, the, the further adoption and growth of this market. So let's hope <laughs> this thing is backed. But uh, I, I don't trust Justin Sun, guys. And some of you may disagree with me, but I don't trust him. Um, I could be wrong. I, I'm not saying that you know I, I have all the proof, but just the different stories and investigations and story, different things that have come around, come out about this guy over the years. And I've been here since 2016, have not been good. Finally, Mobile Coins' new CEO wants to focus on cross-border payments. Sarah Drakely um, was previously the CTO of MobileCoin. So I don't know much about MobileCoin. Um, you know, it's interesting that they're looking to do this, but let me give you some details. Uh, so MobileCoin has appointed Sarah Drakely as CEO of the global payment infrastructure company. Drakely was previously chief technology officer at the firm, though she told Blockworks that she joined MobileCoin five years ago as an engineer following stints at SpaceX and Disney Animation Studios. MobileCoin, known for its partnership with encrypted messaging app Signal, uh, was in the news earlier this year after its chief product officer, Bob Lee, was killed in San Francisco. Lee was also the creator of Cash App. In an interview with BlockWorks, Drake Lee explained that the part of her focus for MobileCoin is solving real problems for real people. In particular, she noted she wants to focus on cross-border payments. Sending money should be as easy as sending signal messages, said Drake Lee. I agree with that. And it seems like everybody's trying to tackle this issue. We know uh, we have Ripple doing it. You also have folks at Ethereum, Chainlink, and many other projects trying to tackle and solve this uh, issue. She continues here saying, we are enabling communities globally to take control of their assets securely, hopefully leading to more economic development and stability through a reliable infrastructure and easy to use mobile applications, Drakely said in a press release announcing her appointment on Wednesday. So this is interesting and we'll see uh, where it goes. Um, in October of last year, MobileCoin in its partnership with Reserve announced its own stablecoin electric dollars or EUSD which is its own stable coin. According to the announcement uh, on the mobile coin site, EUSD is always backed by a basket of fully collateralized stable coins. So the company is eyeing an expansion into Latin America and Africa. I think there is going to be a lot of competition with the payments market as it relates to crypto and blockchain. And uh, look, different markets may use different coins. I don't think there's going to be one coin to rule them all. Um, I think different parts of the world will use different um, different types of uh, payment providers and there will be interoperability, right? Think of it as there's different car makers in different countries, um, some you know bigger than others, some more successful than others, but uh, nevertheless, there's, you know, different car makers in different countries. So uh, I think something similar here. Um, well, folks, that's the news. Let me know what you think. Leave your thoughts and comments below. Hit the thumbs up button. Share this podcast. Uh, hit the five-star rating. And I'll talk to you all later. Thank you.